Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us this morning for the what can you believe it, the ninth edition of the Balanced Perspective for 2021. The year is absolutely flying by. My name is David Levinson of Ned Group Investments, and as usual, we are joined on the line by Ian Power, CIO of Truffle Asset Management. Ian, thanks so much for joining us. Morning, David, and good morning to everyone on the call. Thanks, Ian. And as I said, it's our ninth uh, edition so far this year. So as usual, we recap some of the global news um, as well as some of the local headlines that have taken shape over the course of the last month. So just last week, the U.S. non-farm payrolls came in um, significantly lower than what was expected, which suggested a more accommodative policy from the Federal Reserve, as well as some language from Jerome Powell um, suggesting that the stimulus will continue that side of the Atlantic. Of course, there's a read-through here is, um, for emerging markets uh, as they suggest a, a more risk-on sentiment. So the RAND uh, rallied along with other EM currencies quite significantly last week. Uh, for those that recall, Ian and I chatted about climate change and climate regulation. I think that was back in May. And what a stunning month it has been for climate change. We have seen droughts and continued fires in California. Germany had some severe flooding. Fires also in Southern Europe and Greece, uh, Turkey, and even North Africa as well. And then there was uh, the hurricane, at least the earthquake, I beg your pardon, in Haiti, which was incredibly devastating. And just last week, we had Hurricane Ida in the US, which many are attributing to climate change and global warming in the atmosphere. Uh, what this hurricane also caused was the outages of certain uh, oil refineries, which has really propped up the oil price um, over the course of the last week as well. So we've seen that sort of move closer to about $70 a barrel. Um, the title for today's session was the old Silk Road, uh, do not pass go, uh, do not click $200 as the old Monopoly saying goes. So I'd like to start in the Far East and slowly move our way westward along that Silk Road. So Ian, I'd like to bring you in at, at this point. Uh, we obviously saw some, some stunning developments from the Chinese Communist Party looking to restrict the amount of time that people's, people spend online over there, uh, particularly aimed at the education sector as well and trying to not really uh, let certain segments of the market profiteer from education. I just want to get a sense because this has been really not oversaturated but spoken quite a fair amount in the market from different asset managers but the sense that what your conversations are Antonia Truffle and has this fundamentally altered your view uh, on the uh, investment prospects of China. Mm. Thanks, David. I think you're right. I think uh, in the media, we've certainly seen some um, developments and announcements by the Chinese government in so far as targeting some of the areas that, where they deem the um, actions of those companies not to be in line with their long-term bigger framework of common prosperity and uh, more importantly of reducing income disparities within their society and i think i think that's probably the the biggest risk at the moment is that some of the headlines that we're seeing are very specific as you said in terms of you know the state's uh, approach to some of the tutoring companies that we've seen and making those companies you know with the stroke of a pen non-profit companies overnight um, really resulting in some significant shareholder, permanent shareholder uh, destruction and wealth destruction. But I think if you take a step back and look at what they're really trying to achieve, they're trying to achieve a society where uh, people uh, in effect have a better life. Uh, first of all, in terms of the affordability of certain services and then, you know, potentially also from a demographic outcome in so far as maybe that you know, if people feel that it is not as expensive as it is currently to educate your, your, your children, you know, that you may in fact see people start to have more than uh, one child. And I think that's really part of the Chinese uh, government's broader policy. But in addition to, to that, I think the, the other issue that we're seeing is the government taking actions to try and create a a more sustainable and a society that supports um, ordinary people insofar as ultimately, uh, you know, resulting in potentially higher wages uh, for these uh, people. And I think it goes down to, you know, some of the announcements which perhaps, you know, haven't been as high profile. Uh, for example, you know, the work hours of, uh, of certain of the workers. And, you know, is it right that workers work six days a week for sort of 16 uh, hours a day, um, you know, so, so to try and do away with some of the practices where the social cost 
of those actions um, is certainly not desirable from a societal point of view. So I think the difference that we see in China versus the Western world is China tends to um, adopt these changes very quickly uh, and, and sometimes with the um, tactfulness of a wounded buffalo and they do it very quickly whereas in the West it's normally a long litigated process with lots of lobbying from all the parties and then finally finding some uh, um, middle ground in the sense of um, you know, policies and practices which are in support of the broader community. So I think whilst we have seen um, pressure on, on, on share prices and the sense that the Chinese government is starting to increase their involvement in the state, which, which one must acknowledge they are starting to do that, their long-term goal is very much focused on common prosperity and reducing the income uh, disparity between the very rich and the poor. And I think that's going to be a delicate balance for them to achieve because I think what you've seen in history is whenever governments get too involved with the state, and we can go back to, to into China's history, um, and one can see how neg negative that is for, for economic growth and for the allocation of capital. So I think China's going to have to find that middle ground in terms of setting that framework for their businesses, uh, which is reasonable in the sense of uh, competition. And then secondly, to the extent that it is supportive of growth whilst they go about this process of closing some of the big wealth inequalities that they've got in their society. And I think the last piece of this uh, equation, which hasn't been spoke about, spoken about in the media, is the green element. In other words, they want the environment uh, within which people live to be better. So really focusing on quality of life and focusing on things like uh, education, healthcare, social services, social support. Uh, these are, are important pillars now which the government is uh, focusing on. And in addition to that, it is the environment. And I think we're seeing lots of changes and there's probably lots more changes to come uh, in so far as the environmental side. And I think allied to your earlier comments around climate change, you know, we're going to see um, regulation and legislated frameworks put in place to make sure that companies, um, you know, change their operating activities in a way which makes them more sustainable and creates a more sustainable and healthy environment for the population to live in. Thank you very much, Ian. And it was, I think, a couple of months ago that the Communist Party, uh, they forewent their, their one-child policy in favor of a three-child policy which maybe speaks a little bit to what you mentioned there. It just seems that a lot of the action is quite far removed from what we, we used to in, in Western economies of the free hand of the economy or laissez-faire economics. Uh, but I, I can sense from yourself, I know you have a son, that there's a bit of empathy for what the Chinese are actually trying to do here in terms of the psychological health as well of the youth um, in terms of, you know, not being at school for 12 hours a day and when they get back from school, getting on computer and playing games and really trying to encourage them to get outdoors. Is, is that a fair statement? I think ultimately, David, it's a balance. And I think that's what is going to be the difficulty for them to achieve. And I think given their command and control nature of their economy, there's probably always the risk that they go too far in so far as the control side. And I think that's something that we have to watch for. But I do think some of the policies and uh, the changes that they have implemented. And if one just breaks down what was happening in the education space and the tutoring space, uh, it was not healthy, not healthy for the parents, not healthy for the children. And I think they're trying to create an environment which is ultimately more sustainable. So I think I do have sympathy for, for some of the policies and initiatives that they're trying to put in place, but ultimately it has to be a balance. And I think that's going to be the key and also the risk in terms of their involvement uh, as the state in many of these companies and uh, the direction of these broader policies. Thank you, Ian. So I'd like to move a little bit more westward along the old historic Silk Road. And I think what we've seen coming out of Afghanistan is very hard to ignore. The American and the Western exit there has obviously led to some incredible humanitarian a humanitarian crisis for lack of a better word but one thing i've tried to really keep my finger on the pulse is looking at some of the corporate social responsibility and what the private sector has done in the wake of the developments there and we've seen the likes of airbnb 
open up, I think it is around 20,000 uh, or free accommodation for 20,000 evacuees or those fleeing their home country of Afghanistan as they land in their new uh, country of residence. Uh, even Uber has been offering free rides to the Global Risk Committee. Even here in South Africa, I think Uber is offering also complimentary rides to people getting to and from some of the, the COVID stations to get their vaccines. Uh, if I think about our parent company, Nedbank, as well, so they contribute quite heavily to the YES or the Youth Employment Scheme in South Africa, as well as the Solidarity Fund during the lockdown. Um, even Sasol, despite its environmental ills, do quite a lot in the social space. I think they contributed something about 10 million rand uh, to the community efforts post the looting. They've donated or at least lent out some medical equipment in the Free State, particularly for rolling out the vaccines there. And I just want to get a sense how an analyst might start viewing corporate social investment or corporate social responsibility. Uh, particularly. So if you're looking at a company, you know, it's a non-tangible type thing. Does this affect your, your valuation of a company at all? And should, so and actually is, should, should shareholders yeah. at least be interested in, in what companies are doing as well for that matter? So I think it's an interesting observation because ultimately in the shorter term, you know, it's hard to draw a linear relationship between those actions and the bottom line P&L. But I think long term, if you look at societies uh, where you do have um, that type of mentality, I think ultimately it is more supportive and creates a, a stronger social fabric um, insofar as being able to deal with crises and issues like we have through the COVID pandemic. And the reality is in South Africa is we don't have a proper social security network. Uh, the country, we're an emerging market. Um, we struggle in so far as delivery of services for a whole host of issues and reasons, which you know we've we've been through in detail before. But I think what that means is that it does create the opportunity for the private sector and for companies to step in and try and assist. I think the biggest problem that we found during this um, process is how do you help? How do you make a difference? And, you know, if you want to contribute money or if you want to contribute time, there's different ways to go about that. So certainly what we saw is there was no shortage of corporates and companies uh, looking and trying to make a difference. But I think we've got a problem in the country in so far as the ability to get the aid to the right people speedily, um, you know, is, uh, is certainly a problem. And there's been lots of question marks around aid at a state level. You know, if the money is uh, donated to the state, that a lot of that gets um, disappeared in, in, in corruption. You know, so I think companies and corporates looking for uh, ways to ensure that the aid and the participation that they have in supporting their local communities actually gets to the people. And um, we spend a lot of time going through the uh, initiatives of a lot of the companies and I think ultimately at the end of the day, you know, those are the communities that support those businesses and the, you know, the shops around them buying their products and services. So, so it makes sense, you know, that you would want to give it back. But I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a more difficult um, or I guess an unclear relationship in the short term, but over the long term, you know, there's no doubt that that certainly engenders a lot of goodwill and uh, obviously helps people when they're going through these difficult times in terms of uh, their own personal uh, crises. But, you know, from a, from a travel point of view, you know, we certainly also um, engaged and we've engaged on multiple levels. And, you know, typically we would, uh, we, have, we have our own projects which we contribute to, but we then look for partners who have uh, similar minded values and uh, we then try and support them and give to the givers would be one of those that uh, you know we have supported and continue to support uh, but i think it is something which we're not just seeing domestically as you've said we're seeing uh, seeing it globally and you know the lack of of proper social security and support ultimately results in um, further uh, social instability and you know ultimately can um, bubble over into the type of insurrection and riots that we saw over over two months ago, and I think that's really a symptom, you know, of uh, the difficulty and the um, the um, the pain that people are feeling in so far as loss of jobs, loss of incomes, and really struggling to make ends meet. So, so we think it's important. 
Julian, and good to hear the efforts that you guys are doing <clears throat> up there in Joburg and across South Africa. And I think corporate social investment crosses that line in the ESG spectrum with social and governance and maybe offers the analyst another a different lens or an avenue to assessing a company and at least the sincerity um, and the DNA of the leadership team. And you mentioned the term value system earlier and, and what they may hold dear. Um, I was, there was an article recently on, on uh, was, I think it was Glencore, for example, and buying some of their old Anglo assets. Um, and someone made an interesting comment there that despite a Glencore um, not necessarily ticking all the boxes from a king code on corporate governance, uh, point of view on, on what optimal governance, governance might look like. And I was thinking about Glencore, and I guess another one that comes to mind is maybe, you know, the Richmond and the Johan Rupert Group is, although they may not be perfect from a governance point of view, investors and fund managers such as yourself actually gain a degree of comfort knowing that these CEOs and chairmen have a, a vested interest in the company or a founder's or mentality approach to the company as opposed to somebody who's brought in an external type CEO. Is, is that a fair statement to make? I think, you know, the proof is always in the pudding. And I suppose at the end of the day, one needs to look at what the data shows us. So, you know, ultimately, when you're looking at um, the way management is running a business in the, in the, in the context of, um, you know, good governance, good social engagement, you know, uh, managing your resources in a, in a responsible um, uh, fashion insofar as your impact on the environment, um, you know, ultimately, we have to look at what the data shows. And I think what what we'll see is when we look at, um, you know, some of these businesses where you, for example, have an owner managed, um, I guess, focus, it can be good in so far as if the vendors or the original uh, shareholders, uh, the founders have that mentality. But I think we've we've also seen and we also see from a from a corporate perspective that if the corporate adopts those values and um, those same sustainable frameworks uh, that you can also see a similar a similar input and i think the challenge would probably be where you have these owner managed or founder businesses where the owners still retain a large chunk of the equity is if there is uh, issues around governance um, or esg which you want to change you know typically then that becomes a lot harder to do uh, versus a corporate where, you know, shareholders all have the ability to to make their voices known as opposed to, for example, a Richemont, which has another, um, you know, complex control structure. So I think it, ultimately the, the proof is in the pudding and we need to evaluate each company on its own merits, look at the data and then get a sense of whether they are, um, you know, being a good steward and, and uh, of their capital and their assets and, you know, is there... Um, a continuous process of improvement in place in so far as E, S, and G. Great. Thank you very much, Ian. I think that's all we have time for this morning. But as always, appreciate these 15 minutes out of your morning and take care and enjoy the rest of your day further. Thanks, David. And thanks to everyone who signed on the call this morning. Great. Thank you. And as usual, just try to quickly summarize some of the main points that came through in the discussion with Ian this morning. Um, starting uh, on the far east of the old Silk Road, the Chinese government actions are designed to support a more equitable growth environment in the country there and remove some of the undesirable social costs of overworking and overextending families financially. Um, unlike the West, the Communist Party are able to move relatively quickly without being tied up in too much bureaucracy. And then Ian pointed out something quite interesting, which hadn't crossed my mind before, was the green element. And they obviously want an environment to be better for the populace as this feeds into everybody's quality of life. Um, I guess the biggest problem here in South Africa with regards to corporate social investment during the COVID lockdown, as Ian mentioned, was that despite a lot of the sincere efforts of corporates, is, is the money getting to the right people? And when Ian and the team uh, look at partnering with certain uh, private sector companies in South Africa, they really look for something that is aligned with their own internal value system. And then with regards to how companies are managed, um, I brought up just a question at the end there around owner mentality among CEOs. Um, versus maybe a company where the CEO has been has been brought in, um, obviously comes with its own reward, but its own risks, and maybe arguable whether their ability to evolve their own ESG and stewardship performance um, going forward is something that Ian and the team look for as well when trying to analyze a company. So, um, and that very rough roundup from myself. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and we look forward to catching up with you next month. Thank you.